Hello everyone, welcome uh, to the second data science webinar series, uh, which is about me talking about how to solve nonlinear PDEs with Gaussian processes and deep neural network and with the implementation done in TensorFlow 2.0. So uh, a brief introduction. My name is Ming Zhong. I'm currently a, an assistant research scientist at the Scientific Machine Learning Lab uh, in the uh, Texas AM Institute of Data Science. We work on problems related to scientific machine learning, which is using machine learning method to solve uh, scientific computing problems. Okay, so let's start. Okay. Um, so uh, we'll talk about how to use uh, uh, machine learning methods to uh, complement or improve some of these traditional numerical methods to solve uh, PDEs, nonlinear PDEs to be particular. And then uh, we'll talk about briefly two uh, uh, most popular machine learning methods for solving PDEs. And then we'll conclude the webinar series with a few comments, okay? So uh, we'll start off with a really, really simple PDE. Say for example, this uh, hit equation, we consider a really, really long uh, metal rod uh, where the, the total length is actually bigger than the cross-sectional uh, area. And then we consider that the two end of this metal rod is insulated, so there's no heat flow in and out. We consider the heat at the two ends is zero, and we want to study the heat uh, actually flow throughout this uh, uh, metal rod. Okay, uh, so well, um, if I formulate this heat transfer uh, problem into math, basically I will let the uh, density u represent the heat density. And then that the time change of heat of this heat density will be diffused away by its double uh, spatial derivative uh, controlled by this lambda, which is the heat uh, uh, thermal conductivity the constant. And because we assume that the two ends are insulated, so there's actually no heat at the two ends. And then we have an initial heat profile for this metal rod and then just release it and let the heat flow naturally. Okay, uh, so normally how we solve this kind of PDEs, uh, in this case, actually really linear PDEs, uh, we will use some kind of uh, separation of variable method, which we consider that the uh, solutions is actually a simple product of two different functions, which in terms is a function of single variable. Okay, and then you plug it in, you obtain actually a series of ODEs for either the X variable and the time variable T, and then you solve it, you obtain that the two solutions, if I can express the initial profile, heat profile, uh, using the Fourier series expansion, is basically just this uh, product of this uh, Fourier series expansion with the exponential function that control the heat flow in time. Okay, so we can have that. Okay, so for example, if I have my uh, initial profile is just a six sine pi x over L, then uh, using for the expansion, I only have one coefficient. Uh, we have the first coefficient being six and everything else is zero. Because of that, my uh, infinite sum becomes only one term. So I have six times sine of pi x over L times the uh, normal exponential in, in terms of time. Okay. And if I have my initial heat profile as a sum of two sine cosine function, then using sine series expansion, I actually have two terms. The, the fourth term is negative seven because of the m pi x here. So we just read off this uh, coefficient in front of pi x. And then the ninth term is 12. We just read off another coefficient in front of pi x. Okay, and everything else is zero. So we have another uh, Fourier series expansion and put the into our two solutions, we obtain the two solution in this form, okay? But if I don't have my initial profile being a really nice uh, sine or cosine function, then I actually have to find out the actual Fourier series expansion for it, and then go through the trouble of integrating this, for example, just a simple innocent constant function and uh, end up with a really complicated expression, okay? So once I have that, I need to plug it in, and then my two solutions will now become my infinite series sum of these uh, coefficients of the initial profile, the Fourier series, uh, series coefficient. Okay, so uh, using this separation of variable method, we can actually find a, an analytic and formula for these two solutions. However, the whole thing boils down to, can I actually integrate the initial profile and get all of these Fourier coefficients? If I cannot do that, 
then this uh, method will not help me. Okay, and in actual computation, because computer only accepts finite number of sums, so we will actually stop somewhere. So that's a, dis a good discussion at where you should stop for this infinite sum. Okay, and this separation variable method only works when we have the two endpoints being zero. Okay, you can generalize a little bit more, but uh, the method only works for this, this really special particular case. If I change the this kind of boundary conditions for the two endpoints, then I have to change the formula again. I even have to use another uh, uh, analytics uh, method to actually find the uh, analytic solution. So this method will not help if I have I don't have this kind of insulated ends. If I have other boundary conditions, I will not be able to find the solutions. So in that case, using a an analytics method to actually find the expression for the two solutions is not viable all the time. We need to resolve to numerical methods. And there are four major kinds of numerical methods. The finite difference, which we think of the solutions on discrete mesh point and then approximate the derivatives. Uh, finite element, which we put a, a triangular, uh, uh, triangular elements on the domain and expect everything as a linear combination of the spaces function or finite volume and special methods, okay? So let's, let's talk about how to use uh, the traditional finite difference method to actually solve these uh, 1D heat equation, okay? So uh, because we are gonna approximate the solutions and discrete mesh points, I need to actually approximate the derivative. So I'm gonna use theta expansion to approximate the second X derivative of U, okay? Basically just the essential difference equation, okay? And then I'm gonna also approximate the time derivative using this forward uh, difference uh, equation to approximate it. Okay. You can also use bad work that, uh, that result, it would, would result into a bad work order scheme, but we can use this for order scheme. Okay. Now we replace these uh, actual derivatives, the UTs and UXX with the approximations of this particular kind. So we have that the forward order in time is approximately the thermal conductivity times the central scheme in, uh, in space. And then we have replaced the differential equation, the partial differential equation with the difference equation. So now with the solutions can be expressed as some kind of linear combination of all the other grid points. So I can actually express my solutions at a little bit ahead in time at the original X as the previous solutions uh, uh, at TX plus its right neighborhood and its uh, left neighborhood, okay? So basically I can actually do that. So that means that I can advance my initial condition even with different uh, boundary conditions, okay? From initial time t equaling zero to t equaling k with one uh, matrix multiplication at the time, okay? If I put a uniform grid point in both the time and in space and think of my finite element solutions at this discrete point, uh, is an approximation to my two solutions, then I will obtain these finite element solutions as a solution to this uh, difference equation, okay? And in this time, I actually uh, uh, express this, this current number, which is the, uh, all of the, the dimension information and also the, uh, the time step in, uh, the step size in time, the step size in space, everything in, in together and call it mu, okay? And, uh, as I said before, as I uh, mentioned before, we can advance the solutions from the initial time through this linear uh, relationship, okay? So, uh, and we have to show that as the step size in space and step size in time goes to zero, we will actually recover the original solutions. As it turns out, in order to do that, have this so-called convergence condition, I need to have my current number less than one half. And that also puts a restriction on how much uh, the, the least amount of times point I can have with this kind of uh, finite difference approximation. So we have that, okay? So uh, uh, to, to write it in a more uh, simpler or compact form, I can write um, all of my finite difference solutions into this huge vector. Remember, we don't need the solutions at the uh, endpoints, at the boundary condition points, because we already have the information. So all the interior, on the spatial interior points, Okay, at the original time step n, tn, okay? So we are obtain a really huge vector, okay? And then I can advance into the next time point using my current solutions 
times this correct number times it is really chi diagonal matrix times my current solutions at this uh, current time point. Okay. So basically, I, I just need to do a matrix vector multiplication at each time in order to advance my solutions. Okay. And then on my initial conditions, basically this initial hit profile. Okay. So yeah, so we're going to test it. We're going to test this on this uh, particular case when the initial hit profile is six times sine of pi x over two. Okay. As uh, remember, we mentioned that uh, using separation of variables, I can actually obtain a two solution and the next two solutions for this particular initial profile. Okay. Uh, and then we'll test it and compare the uh, final different solutions to these two solutions. Okay. We will choose that our step size in space is one over 10. And because we also have a convergence method, we need to have the uh, step size in time less than a half of h squared, which that means that I need to do at least 200 uh, time steps in order to have a convergent method or convergent solutions. Okay. We'll compare the final different solutions to the true solution side by side to see if we can actually have recover the true solutions as we cut down the, 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 uh, the step sizing uh, space. So let's look at this demo code that I have here. Okay. So uh, uh, by the way, you, uh, you can email me, I will actually send you all of these demo code that I have for this particular web, uh, webinars. Okay, so in this case, this, this particular code does not use any tensorflow. We just need to use uh, NumPy to construct our matrix and vectors, uh, SciPy for actually the sparse structure because we actually need to uh, construct this A, I only have three diagonals. We don't need to uh, waste uh, any storage and then just use matplotlib to actually plot everything out. Okay, so remember our uh, initial test is that the final time is at two, the, uh, the length of the metal rod is only, only two, and uh, the uh, thermal conductivity uh, constant is uh, one. Okay, so the initial hit profile is just uh, six times sine of pi x over two. Okay, and then because of that using separation of variable, then my two solutions is of this form, okay, times this exponential function. We will take one over 10 as, as our step size in space. Okay, and then because of that, in order to have a convergence method, I need my uh, step size in time to be less than half of h squared. So I have to have h squared over two there for my time step size, okay? And then we'll call this current number as just uh, the thermal conductivity times k over h squared, okay? And then we'll use the, uh, uh, the num we will find out the number of uh, points in space and number of points in time to actually construct our solutions, find the different solutions. And then we'll use three, only three diagonal because the uh, A is actually a sparse matrix with only three diagonal. The first one is one minus two times mu. And uh, that's the main diagonal. So uh, if you see, let me go back to the slides. If you see here, this is negative two times mu, but then I have, this is the main diagonal. So it's one minus two mu, okay? So that's why we have one minus two mu, okay? Oh, sorry. And then the off and uh, the super and the uh, and the sub diagonal are just normal mu, okay? And then we will go from, we start off from the initial time, we'll uh, set the initial profile to the initial solutions, I mean the initial hit profile, and then each time we'll just advance in time by multiplying this A matrix, this particular A matrix, tight diagonal matrix to our system, okay? Then remember to fix your uh, two endpoints to zero because the two endpoints are always fixed to zero. And here's this comparison of these uh, two solutions with this, uh, versus the final different solution. As you can see, even with H's being uh, over and over 10, we actually obtain a pretty high accuracy for this, okay? Um, okay, so that's the first demo for final difference method. Uh, you can actually increase this uh, H even further, but remember each time when you cap the H in half, you need to cap the step size in uh, a cord. So do remember this uh, CFL condition on this final difference method. Okay, so now um, we, we, we actually uh, introduce a little bit about this final difference method, basically just approximate the derivative using theta expansion. Okay, uh, it can handle pretty general uh, initial conditions and boundary conditions, basically uh, remember to fix the two endpoints. Okay, and then uh, however, it will generate really large, but sparse symmetric and positive negative definite matrix uh, 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 to actually multiply to the solution in each time step. If I use a barrel Euler, I need to actually solve it at each time step. Okay, you can actually generalize it to uh, 2D 
uh, in space, heat equation or 3D in space equation, you will again obtain a really sparse, but uh, a five diagonal matrix for 2D and seven diagonal matrix for 3D. But then the size of this, uh, all those sparse, but large matrix growth exponentially with the dimension of the space. So actually it will create a really headache, a huge headache if you want to go with the final difference for higher dimension, okay? And then remember our correct uh, CFL condition, the correct number has to be less than a half in order to have a convergent method that also puts a, the minimum number of time steps on our final difference method. If you want to have the solution to be convergent, you need to do this many time steps. Otherwise, you won't be able to obtain a, a reasonable solutions. And because the final difference obtained all the solutions at discrete uh, grid points, there's no way we can do, uh, well, we, we, we can obtain the uh, integrate values using interpolation, but then this is not automatic. We have to do it by ourselves. We have to put a, a interpolant around all the script points to obtain any interpret values. And there's also um, not an easy way to obtain the derivatives. We have to need to differentiate, but we only have discrete grid points. So that's, uh, we need to, we, we can only approximate this derivative instead of just uh, basically differentiate the basis function, for example, the final elements or special methods. Okay, and also for final difference, you cannot uh, handle uh, irregular domain. You actually need to shape shift, and it can only handle basically just rectangular or square domains, or maybe with L-shaped domains, but um, not that easy to actually generalize this to handle irregular domain. Okay, so uh, to to remedy some of these uh, drawbacks of the final difference, say for example, I cannot have uh, integrate uh, point values. I cannot have find the derivatives easy. Sometimes you can, and also I cannot handle a regular domain, then I can replace it with the so-called final element method, which puts a triangular uh, mesh element on the domain so that you can actually mesh out any uh, shape of the domain, okay? But it uses weak formulation. So you, you need to actually solve uh, an integral in order to get these uh, big matrix for solving for the coefficients. And you actually be, have to be really careful on, on how to actually choose your basis, okay? Um, well, we have to solve the integral. We will still uh, end up with a really large, but hopefully sparse linear system to solve at the end. And those systems are really nice, but we have to take time to actually assemble this linear system, okay? So that's one of the job of the final element. We can also replace these uh, uh, large sparse linear system when we assemble for the final element or final difference with a small but dense linear system using a special method, but it works nicely if I have periodic boundary condition, okay? Uh, if I don't have periodic boundary condition, I actually need to use a shape shape basis in order to resolve that, okay? Uh, but uh, uh, for the integrals, I, I can use fast Fourier transform to obtain all the coefficients, but there are still some drawbacks with uh, using special methods. So, my point is, all of this is my point is, can I actually uh, use a method that the computer can actually learn kind of automatically and kind of uh, go around all of these difficulties I mentioned, say how to construct mesh, how to actually uh, provide uh, automatic interpolation. So any grid values at inter-grid points, okay? And also provide auto differentiations, like basic things, and also handle irregular domain, or maybe high dimensional domain, all of this stuff. Can I actually use the computer to actually teach me to do that, okay? So there are actually, so here comes uh, two uh, popular, most popular methods, machine learning methods that you can actually use for solving PDEs, okay? The first one is the uh, so-called physics informed neural network, which is a, a deep learning based method you can use to teach the computer to solve PDEs. The second one is actually you assume that the solutions uh, has some kind of Gaussian uh, pair and then you can fit that using Gaussian process. That is the so-called physics informed Gaussian process method to actually solve for these PDEs. Okay, so we will talk about all of this. So I mentioned that uh, we have these traditional numerical methods, but each method has its own strength and weakness. What, what we want to do is, can we actually combine all of the strength of each different methods and get out something really nice? For example, can I actually develop a method uh, that I don't need to do a mesh? Uh, I, it can provide auto interpolation. Uh, for file element and special method, it has the auto interpolation because it's expressed as a linear combination of basis, but find a difference will not do it, okay? Can I have a solution that provide me the auto differentiation capability? Uh, for that, um, 
finite element and special method kind of can give you that, but you still need to differentiate. Okay, uh, can I actually handle complex uh, geometric domain uh, of a regular shape? Uh, even if the domain is of really high dimensional uh, and can actually handle it without the curse of dimensionality for this high dimensional domain, okay? And uh, uh, for finite element and special method, we actually need to be careful about how to choose a basis, okay? Can I actually let the data to tell me how to choose the basis so that I don't need to do uh, the basis selection, okay? And maybe handle uh, as many different kinds of initial condition and boundary condition as possible, okay? That's basically what I want to do with this new method. And I also want to add new equations or even new inequalities of physics uh, informed inequalities to the solutions on the fly. Basically, I want to do it where, when I see that it's, the solutions is not good, can I add more equations to make it converge faster or converge to better with a better accuracy, okay? And maybe I can also do uncertain quantification. Can, I, can, it, can the solution tell me where it is uh, at which point of the solutions inside the domain, it is not certain about the accuracy. Can they actually do that? I want to combine all of this together. And most importantly, if I don't have the necessary or adequate initial condition and boundary conditions, can I, with some kind of observation data and use it to actually discover these initial condition, uh, boundary conditions, or even the parametric structure of my PDE. So some, some uh, inverse problem capability. I want to build all of this into these uh, machine learning methods, okay? So as I mentioned, we have two major uh, popular, most popular machine learning method. One is using the deep neural network. The other one is using a Gaussian process. So basically, I'm just assuming my solutions is of this form is a linear combination of some coefficients with some bases where I can actually find the coefficients. So traditional method, you find the coefficients and with the known basis, but for new methods, I want to find coefficients and the basis both on the data. And my basis is either a neural network or a Gaussian process. That's what I want to do, okay? So let's uh, uh, dive into the first kind of this machine learning method for solving uh, nonlinear PDE. So the first one is this uh, physics informed neural network, okay? Basically, I'm assuming this solutions is a, uh, a deep neural net. Uh, it's basically a fit for neural network. Uh, when I say fit for, it basically mean that the uh, information flows from uh, the left to the right. So the uh, red balls uh, indicating the input variables and the blue balls indicating the output variables. Okay, so it only flows from the input to the output. There's no way for the information to go back. So it's only fit for, so it's only going forward in time. I mean, in, in the information flow, not in time. There's no time. Uh, variable here yet, okay? And the yellow balls will indicate these are uh, the hidden layers of all the neurons. And I'm gonna consider these, this network is fully connected, okay? So every single neuron is connected to the one before and also to the one uh, after, okay? So it's fully connected. Uh, and I want to use this faithful neural network to ask my candidate to solve PDEs. That's what I want to do with this, okay? So basically, uh, the, I'm assuming my solutions is a fit for a neural network. Basically, it's a composition of a different linear mass with an uh, activation functions, okay? So here, uh, I'm assuming that my uh, vector x here contains both the time variable and the space variable. So we'll put everything into one single vector, okay? So as you can see, it has one input layer, which is that the red balls, so one input layer, and also one upper layer. Okay, it has K minus one hidden layers and all of these hidden layers, I will have WK neurons. Okay, it's just basically like a neural net. Just, okay, and then uh, these, these on each, this uh, on each hidden layer, it will have an input from the previous layer. Okay, we'll call it ZK. Okay? It will be transformed by a linear map. It's actually an affine map. Okay, and then activated component-wise, basically just apply this function component-wise. Uh, to 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 this uh, 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 output after this linear map, okay, and each uh, 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 each result is actually composite with the next one, okay. So here my activation functions is applied component wise. It can be a hyperbolic tangent function or a ReLU function. We'll talk about what these two functions look like or something else we cannot, but these two will be the most popular choices of activation functions. And I mentioned that my uh, LK is a linear map, FI map. So when I apply this to my input ZK, I'm basically just doing a linear transform of my ZK 
cause some uh, bias BK. Okay, as you can see, if I don't have my activation function being nonlinear, then everything is just a linear function. Okay, so that makes uh, that makes the whole thing lost in nonlinearity. So we have to have the activation function being nonlinear. Okay. And then if I have, uh, well, in this case, in our setting, I'm gonna assume that the uh, output is only one dimensional so that the, uh, the final neuron at the output layer is only one, okay? Then we'll have a total of one plus all the neurons at each layers, sum of all these different uh, number of neurons on each layer all the way up to the input layer, okay? And then we will uh, denote that the, the, this, this parameters for this linear transformation map and also the bias vector BK, uh, I'll put them all in, together into this theta, called it the big theta, which basically just a concatenation of all this linear map plus the bias. Okay, well, not plus, but and the bias. Okay, and each uh, uh, hit and each uh, uh, neural network layer. Okay, so we have total a really huge, huge uh, number of parameters, and over parameterization in this case actually help us. So we we are not gonna uh, yeah be afraid of this huge number. Okay, so. Here's the uh, shape of one of these activation function. This is the hypertension uh, uh, activation function. So it's actually a C infinity function, but it has a large uh, derivative at zero and it's kind of uh, symmetric about the zero point, okay? So basically make your function smoother and nice, uh, alpha function smoother and nice for the neural network. And this is the ReLU activation function. Uh, this is a continuous function, but it has uh, not uh, discontinuous derivative because uh, at this point uh, it will be a constant here, zero here, and then a negative one there, uh, depending on the slope. Okay, so actually this is uh, good to use when you have uh, uh, when you know that your your solutions is gonna be gonna be having a discontinuous derivative, then you probably want to use a ReLU function. Okay, so well remember for a, a traditional machine learning method, we will obtain these parameters for the uh, linear transformation map and also the biases uh, uh, from solving, of minimizing a certain loss function, okay? And depending on the applications, this loss function can be of a probability for the classification or regression for a continuous function, okay? So for our problem, we are thinking of a PDE problem. So we're gonna assume that we have an open and bounded domain within some uh, high dimensional space that we have a, a partial differential operator apply to this solution that we get zero well, or some kind of four single thing at the right hand side. And then a boundary differential operator that apply to this solution. So I guess something on the boundary. So we are, we are gonna assume we have this kind of setting. So this particular laws that we use to chain the parameters will become a, a sum of two different losses. One is so-called the PD residual loss which I will tell you, uh, well, actually I just write it out. And then the other one is the boundary condition data loss, okay? So the PD residual loss, because we want our solutions, our neural network solutions to satisfy the PD. So we are gonna plug these neural network solutions into this partial differential operator and want the difference as small as possible at as many points as possible. So in this case, we are not gonna assume that this, this uh, number of, so this NC here, here is called the number of publication points. We're gonna, we are not gonna assume we will have a limited budget. We're gonna assume we can actually get as many uh, publication points as possible, okay? And we want this uh, PD residual to be as small as possible and as many points as possible inside the, uh, the computational domain. And then we will also want the neural network solution to match the boundary condition as also close as possible as as many boundary condition points as possible, okay? So that's the initial approach. Basically, you, you find, you chain the parameters by minimizing this loss as a sum of a PD residual loss and boundary data loss, okay? You can also add a different weight to this PD residuals that because the two things don't need to be equally weighted, okay? Uh, and there's a way to actually, you can actually preset these, these uh, weighting loss for the PD residual and boundary the data loss, okay? Or you can actually pre-compute or actually compute them on the fly using the so-called neural tension kernel method, which is uh, pointed out by this paper here in 2020 by uh, uh, pretty, uh, pretty carries and all from the, uh, their group at UPenn, random Y pins failed to chain, 
Okay, you can actually look at this paper and actually use a method they propose to actually compute these two different losses, okay, on the fly, okay? So that you can drive this loss uh, to zero as possible, to as small as possible, okay? You can also uh, uh, push this idea by uh, different weighting laws for different, uh, uh, there's different kinds of laws into like different points because remember uh, all of these uh, PD residual loss and also boundary data loss, they are actually some of different points, okay? So I can assign different laws weight to these residual at different points using a mass function, okay? And this, uh, the mass function is actually fixed, but the weight can be actually trained from the data. You don't need to actually uh, pre-assign these weighting laws. Uh, the this, uh, this second paper by our group actually uh, proposed a method to learn these weighting laws from data so that you can actually drive this total loss to as, as small as possible okay, based on the PDE you are given, okay? So that's, that's the different uh, weighting scheme for these, okay? So now go back to our simple hit equation example. So remember we have that the hit transfer equation with the initial hit profile and uh, two insulated endpoints. So at the two endpoints, we have no hit, okay? So the PD residual would be UT minus lambda, which is the thermal conductivity constant uh, times UXX is equal to zero. So we want this PD residual to as much as possible at as many points as possible. And also I have a boundary condition point. So I have that the boundary conditions at three different pieces of boundaries because uh, we have the initial conditions. So in this case, um, I want to mention that uh, this, this kind of, this type of pin method uh, do not have, does not have the time matching uh, nature building here. It actually think of the space and time as a unity. So just basically just uh, discretizing the whole space time. Okay. So we have the initial conditions as part of the final boundary. We have the left boundary and the right boundary. Those two are zero. And the initial heat profile is F of X. When this X vector is at this, uh, is at time zero and the space. So X is from zero to capital L. So because of that, my PD residual would be minimizing as, as many uh, collocation points as possible uh, between the, uh, the actual PD residual applied to, the, to my neural network solutions, okay? And then because my boundary conditions have three different parts, I actually have three different boundary laws to actually apply to. You can actually put them all together using a step function. Uh, but you can, uh, but for our case, let's just write everything out so that it will, uh, it can be easily seen. Okay, so the first boundary condition is actually the initial condition. Okay, we want to have the, oh, that should be an F here. Okay, we want to have the difference between the uh, neural network solutions to the initial hip hop profile as close as possible uh, uh, for as many boundary condition points. And then the second one is actually wanting to be zero. So we just minimize the uh, squares of those uh, neural network solutions. And we want it to be small, as small as, as possible for this left boundary. And then same thing for the right boundary. So you can see the difference here that for the X coordinate is one is zero. The other one is, a, uh, is capital L, okay? So yeah, let's, let's do the test again. Let's, uh, let's uh, check this out. Uh, we would use the same uh, cases. So L is equal to two, T is equal to two, the thermal conductivity uh, constant is one. We still have the initial hit profile six times pi x over two. With that, from the separation of variable approach, we have this two solutions to we can actually compare to. Uh, in this case, we are gonna use a total of 2,048 points. So it actually kind of matches with the, uh, uh, the final difference scheme that we use is 10 points in space, 200 points in time. So it's roughly 2,000 points in total, okay? And then we'll use 64 points on each different boundary. So that's why there's times three here. And then we will use a really simple uh, neural network. Uh, you can actually get it down to maybe four layers, but yeah, seven hidden layers is what we uh, usually do. So we will take seven hidden layers and 20 neurons on each layer. And we will use only a first order atom chaining uh, with a learning area of five times 10 to negative four. And we only do 5,000 iterations. It's actually really fast. So uh, and the accuracy is actually pretty good, okay? It will compare the final different solutions to the two solutions side by side, okay? So let's look at the code. Uh, uh, 
uh, and again, if you have, uh, you're interested in getting this code, I can send you uh, an email and then you can actually download all of this. So this is the code to solve the heat equation. So it's actually the exact same example as the finite difference equation. So same setup, same equations. Uh, uh, because we are using pin, we have to actually have to write out the chaining, the air functions to, to chain the parameters. So the losses, the PD residual loss plus three different kinds of boundary conditions. Okay, the PD residual is just UT minus lab times UXX and there's three different boundary conditions. One correspond to the initial condition and uh, the other one is left and the last one is the right boundary condition. Okay, so to use, to implement this intensifier, so this time I will probably go a little bit slower. So to implement that intensifier, you need uh, several packages. Uh, again, uh, uh, you can actually run this code on Google Collab Collab has everything set up so that it can actually run uh, uh, the TensorFlow code on GPU. You can also run it on your local machine. Uh, uh, if you have an NVIDIA uh, uh, graphic card, then I suggest you to run it on your local machine. If not, you can also run this on uh, HPRC. Uh, they also provide you with uh, uh, GPU computing capability. Okay, so uh, uh, and you can also run TensorFlow on CPU. It's just a little bit slower. But uh, if you have really uh, powerful enough CPU uh, with multi cores, it can actually do run pretty fast with TensorFlow. Okay, uh, so we import the TensorFlow package, and uh, on my local machine, I already set up everything, so it will actually run on G uh, GPU. Okay, uh, Kira is the uh, interface for actually constructing all the uh, uh, neural network and the hidden layers. Okay, uh, uh, we will do a sequential model, which is the feed forward neural network. Okay. Uh, these two packages is for the input and the hidden layer. Uh, I believe also dense is for the upper layer, okay? We will actually import the layers package to which you construct all these uh, uh, linear mapping and activation functions, okay? And uh, the, the TensorFlow Keras has many, has many different uh, activation functions implemented already, so you can actually look it up. Uh, it has the most popular one is the hypertension and the ReLU, but ReLU has this, uh, 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 gradient blow up issues and also uh, dying gradient. So uh, they're actually suggesting you use a switch function or, a, uh, or other function to actually replace value. Okay. Uh, the mixed position is just for me to use double position to actually calculate everything. Uh, TensorFlow probability is used for the second order uh, method, chaining method. So we don't, you don't need to actually get that. Uh, this is only for uh, plotting. So we will skip this. So first thing first, I declare that my, all my data type is of flow 64. So it's actually double position, okay? And then I force the system, the TensorFlow packages to only use a double position for all of the points for my calculation, okay? So remember, I'm gonna use 2000 collocation point and on each, uh, we have three different boundaries, but on each is the smaller boundary, I am gonna use 64 points. This is my final time is 2.0. This is the total length of my metal rod is also 2.0. The thermal conductivity is 1.0. So that I know that the, I also have initial profile, heat profile with that I have my two solutions. So it's basically exactly what we have for the, for the slides, okay. And then we set up the, uh, the limits for the X point and the, uh, the T points and X points. And then I will construct the uh, neural network, okay. So we'll have two variables. We'll, so remember the input dimension, the number of neurons on the input layer equals to the dimension of your computational domain. It's not the number of sample sizes. It has nothing to do with the number of sample sizes. It's only the dimension of your uh, computational domain. Okay, so for this case, we have P and X, so we have two. And then in between, we're gonna have seven hidden layers. And on each layer, we have 20 neurons. So we get seven times 20. And then the last output layer is only of dimension one. So we use put one neuron there, okay? And then we'll construct this uh, neural network using this function call. So we will call a sequential to actually initialize these layers, okay? And then we'll add each layer using, uh, using this layers package. Okay, so the first one is an input layer, so it's really special, okay? So we use the input shape, uh, which is uh, given by these layer sizes, okay? And then in between, we'll build up the hidden layers, 
Okay, so they they will be a dense layer instead of input layer. So input layer is of a, if if uh, its own uh, layer type. Okay, and then uh, the width is actually uh, our number of neurons. So this width is the number of neurons. So it's twenty here. The activations we can just pick hypertension. Okay, you can also just replace this with uh, tf dot okay. And if you use hypertension, please initialize the weights using glute norm, okay? Uh, because this is believed to have uh, 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 the final weights don't blow up, okay? So you want to go with that, okay? And then uh, at the end, the output layer, remember the output layer, we do not want any activation functions. Otherwise your output is constrained for hypertension for negative one to one. It makes no sense at all. So we take that off. And then again, initialize it with glue, uh, global normal distribution method. Okay, so now I print out the summary of my models. As you can see, we have a total of eight layers with seven hidden layers. Okay, and then on these uh, seven hidden layers, we have 20 neurons. So at, at the end, I have about 2,601 parameters to change for my neural network. Okay, and then next, we will. Uh, uh, define the PD residual loss function and also the boundary condition loss function for our uh, 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 neural network chaining, okay? In this case, this PD residual is actually tied to the heat e uh, equation, okay? Uh, so first thing, I will actually concat T and X together to actually, to for it so that I can evaluate my neural network at these variables, okay? So I want to stop here to mention a few things. Okay, um, now you probably want to say that, uh, uh, so in this case, I'm actually sending my independent variables separately. So if I have more dimensions, say for example, if I have 2D heat equation, then I actually have to do T, X, Y. Okay, that makes the whole coding really, really unreadable. Okay, however, if you do that, uh, if you think of this, you can actually concat everything into big X and then send the big X in as the uh, variable, the dependent, independent variable for the whole thing. And then your dimension will be de decided by the dimension of X, but you'll be careful how to actually uh, uh, calculate this uh, first and second derivative. Okay, we can talk about that later. So now here I evaluate my neural network at this uh, combined variable, because uh, so uh, remember uh, for the TensorFlow structure is the rows represent different number of samples the columns represent the dimension of your variable. So that's why we, we will concat them into columns. That's why it's dimension one, okay? So now we, uh, again, the neural network provides you an auto differentiation cap capability. So we do TF dot gradients of my uh, function with respect to the variable. Uh, the reason why I reshape them is because um, they, they output a different shape. So it's actually easier to, for me to do a uh, vector multiplication with all of these. So I reshape them into the correct shape, okay? And then I differentiate U with respect to X using TF gradients, and then also reshape them into the same shape and then do it again for the second derivative. Then my heat equation is just UT minus lambda times UXX, okay? Here, as you can see, I actually declare my lambda as a tensorflow constant to make my vector multiplication easier. Uh, because if you don't do that and you declare them as a normal number, it will not do it. Uh, it will not do the vector multiplication automatically for you. So you need to use a tensorflow constant, okay? And then for the uh, boundary condition, this is really simple. You evaluate your model at your variables and just take the difference between the two and the, the two boundary values and the predicted boundary values, okay? So that's how you define the functions. And then I define my loss functions. Uh, so in this case, I'm gonna, uh, so uh, the, the, the PD residual loss and boundary condition loss is actually a, a just a mean square loss. So I just do reduce mean and then just do L2. So we have to do everything in TensorFlow. So TF dot power square. You can also do, uh, do the absolute values so that you have the MAE loss, but chaining in MAE loss is really, really difficult. Just, I want to warn you about this, okay? So the total loss is just the residual loss plus the boundary condition loss. I return off three of them because I want to output to see which loss is going down faster than the others, okay? And then uh, now, because we, we, 
we define a loss function, we need to calculate the gradient, okay? So I need to define the gradient for, for this lot particular loss function. So I compute the total loss and then use the tape dot gradient capability to actually compute the derivative of the total loss with respect to all of my neural network variables. That's how well we do, okay? And once I obtain the gradients, I can use it to update uh, uh, update my uh, parameters either in atom or stochastic gradient descent. Uh, okay, so I have the gradient. So that's how we fit it. Uh, we input the neural network, the initial neural network, all the collocation points, the boundary points, and the boundary values. Okay, by default, I set it to 10k iterations and 5 uh, times 10 to negative 5 as my um, initial learning rate. Learning rate is like a step size. Uh, 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 in, in this uh, gradient descent method. So you can think of this as just a step side, okay? So I would declare my optimizer ultim using uh, the uh, API in Curious. So Curious uh, provide a lot of different uh, optimizers, like stochastic gradient descent, atoms, atom SE, all the different variants of atoms, you can look them up. Uh, we basically use either a stochastic gradient descent or an atom to actually change for that. Uh, however, QS do, does not provide any second order chaining method. Okay, so in order to use uh, LBFGS or, or, or uh, BLVS, uh, LBFGSB, you actually have to use uh, TensorFlow probability. Okay, so we'll talk about that later. Uh, um, I, just, I just minimize my output each time so that I can keep track of the losses. Okay, so here I find, so each time I find the gradient of my loss, and then I, well, uh, you can skip this step. Basically, I'm just remembering all the uh, loss history here. And then I apply the gradient. So we'll see, so atoms don't apply gradients by, uh, with this particular gradient and my parameters, okay? So that's how you apply your update, you, how you update your parameters. Basically, just put them all together, okay? Once I'm done, I will check if I'm at the output uh, number. If, if, I, if I'm indeed at the output number, I, I output all my different losses, okay? So I, I have to fit, I have my losses. Now I'm ready to actually put up the data. So that's how I put up the data. So I use the collocation point. It's basically it's just any random hyper Latin uh, cube in TNX dimension. And then I set up my initial condition point, left boundary, Y boundary. As you can see, I every single thing they are declared in tensor uh, variables within the TensorFlow package. So you need to convert them into tensor. Okay, you can do it in in, in uh, uh, vectors matrix in NumPy, but you have to convert them into tensor at the end. Okay, once I have that, I actually plot out these points. Okay, as you can see, the blue points are the left boundary, the black are the right boundary, the red ones are the initial condition points. The blue ones are the randomly selected. So they are randomly picked, chosen. So they actually don't grow exponentially according to the dimension of the domain. So you can just randomly choose them, okay? And then at these uh, blue points, I minimize the residual. That's what we want to do, okay? And then once we pick the maximum number of atoms and the learning rate, we just check, okay? So that's, here's is the output. At, at each particular output uh, numbers, okay? I will output the residual loss, the boundary condition loss and the total loss, okay? Because I don't have any particular, I did not apply any particular weighting. So I just add them all together. So as you can see, we can get the PDE residual loss really good, but the boundary condition is not fitting well. And then once I change it a little bit, and now I can fit the boundary condition good. And then both the boundary and bound, uh, the PDE residual and the boundary condition are fitted really well. And then eventually I get down to here, okay? So let's plot them together, as you can see. Compare this to, you, you don't find any particular errors, uh, at least according to eyeball norms. And then we can also compare, we should, off, we should probably output the errors here. So these two look, well, uh, not for the pin here, there's not quite zero there, okay? So that's, that's how we do the uh, 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 neural network solutions for heat equations. So it's actually really simple, okay? Now, how about I do some non-linear PDEs? So we, we can add, a vection term, okay, a nonlinear vection term to the diffusion equation, I mean to the heat equation. So I end up with a viscous Burgers equation, okay. So the same initial profile, okay, uh, basically same uh, insulated endpoints in some sense, okay, but I actually extend the uh, spatial domain a little bit to negative L, 
Okay, so now I obtain a nonlinear PDE with a nonlinear vection. Okay, oh sorry. Okay, so now my PD residual will be just U T minus U U X uh, plus U U X minus mu times U X X. Okay, just a teeny change in here. You can think of this mu as just lambda. Okay, so I need to put it into my PD residuals. My boundary conditions stay the same. So they basically the same three different pieces of boundary conditions with the initial condition, left boundary and right boundary. So that's how I picked all of these, okay? Remember, we think of the space and time as one unity. So that's why this both phase X here represent a vector. So we have that, okay? So let's, let's test it out. So we're gonna uh, take L is one. So we have a negative one to one domain, okay? We will uh, all the way evolve up, up to three over pi. That's my funnel time and my viscosity is about 0.01 over pi. And then my initial profile is negative sine pi X, okay? We're gonna take again, our, uh, now the true solutions, the uh, true solution for the viscous burgers has to be computed using the hopeful, hopeful uh, transformation. We cannot use any, um, we cannot obtain an actual formula for that. We use the same number of collocation points, okay? As before, we will use the same number of points for the boundary condition, same actual neural network, same chaining method. And then we'll com uh, compare these uh, pin solutions to the true solutions side by side. So let me show that. Okay, so that's the Burgers solution, okay? So I, this time I will skip a little bit because we already go through a lot of details here. So remember we have this nonlinear term for the evaction term. We we'll basically just add it into the PD residual and everything is the same for the heat equation. So basically this is very, behaves really similar to the heat equation, okay? Basically, I changed the final time and the length of my spatial domain. That's the only thing that I did, okay? And then this is my viscosity term. Uh, and then again, I declare that as a tensor flow constant right away because I want to use it in my PD residual laws, okay? Same thing happens here for my uh, neural network uh, structure. And then for my uh, true solutions for my focus, I need to use the whole a uh, closed transformation to obtain this quadrature rule to actually compute that, okay? So now um, the only thing changed is the PDE. So uh, we, we compute, so we still compute UT, UX, and UXX. So uh, that, uh, there's no way you can jump to the second derivative uh, right away. You have to actually do it once at a time. So that's why we have to obtain a UX first before we do UXX, okay? But for burgers, we will actually put in this nonlinear avection term, okay? So it's, uh, without this nonlinear avection, this is awfully similar to a heat equation, okay? So same for the boundary loss, okay? So uh, this loss function is actually the same, the gradient is the same, all the point setup are also the same, so we skip that, okay? So for the construction of all the points, cohesion points are the same, the initial points are the same, boundary points are the same, so they're actually the same as the heat equation case, as you can see for this uh, printout of this setup of points for computation. So left boundary, right boundary, initial point and blue points are the uh, 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 collocation points for reducing the PD residuals. And then we just chain. Uh, we get the errors is actually a little bit bigger than what we have for the heat equation. Okay, so the heat equation, we can actually get down to the loss all the way down to 10 to negative four for, for burgers. Uh, well, if we chain more, we can definitely get down to 10 to negative four, but for this, just, just the same amount of chaining and same learning rate, we get down to only 10 to negative three, okay? Uh, because the rates are initialized randomly, uh, some cases, for some cases, you might be able to get uh, below 10 to negative three. So we just want to mention that. And then we just plot out these uh, two solutions side by side. We have these two solutions, but this uh, viscous burger uh, solution, so, uh, uh, at the center point zero here, it forms a roughly the sharp line, okay? It's not the exact hyperbolic yet, okay? So my pin solutions can actually capture that a little bit, but once it get down to the zero here, it soften out. That's a, 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 well, for one thing, we didn't change that well for another, uh, probably because we need to use a deeper net, but for this, we will discuss this later, okay? So that's, that's how you do, Nonlinear PD is repaint. Basically, you set up the PD residual uh, as given by the PD equations, and then you can do everything with this later. Okay, so let me go back. So that's, yeah. Okay, 
Now, uh, so we talk about how to solve viscous burgers using pin, uh, and then and then um, how about I I have an integral differential equations. What if I have so this whole thing is linear, but uh, uh, instead of having everything with differentials, I have integral equations. You can actually do that. Uh, uh, we actually implement one of this method. You can look out this paper for actually. Uh, solving this is called the radi radioactive transfer equation. You can actually do that by expressing this integral as a uh, uh, Riemann sum. So you can actually express that as a finite sum, and then you can solve this pretty uh, with pretty high accuracy. Okay, uh, uh, and then uh, what if I want to solve a hyperbolic PDEs? So I have this uh, hyperbolic PDEs. The only initial conditions uh, as of right now, normal pin even with weighted uh, self adapted pin cannot do this. Uh, that well, but if you add certain artificial viscosity to this hyperbolic PDEs, you can actually capture some of this shock behavior. And we, we just pushed out a paper on discussing how you can add particular artificial PDE, um, no, sorry, artificial viscosity, especially at where the shock line is, then you can actually obtain pretty good approximation to your original solutions. Uh, you can look up our paper on this. Uh, due to time constraint, we will not discuss, uh, discuss here. Okay, so uh, basically, what I did is uh, we we go through we went through some example of using pin to solve a heat equation and also viscous Burgers equation. We also mentioned a little bit about differential integral equations. Okay, uh, we we always use pin is because it's really really pin is really flexible by adding as many different equations as as possible as possible to your problems. Okay. Once you realize that the pin is not converging, then it's, uh, it's actually not capturing the true physics behind the PDE, so you can actually add more conditions to it, okay? And if you use adaptive loss weights, you can actually use it to solve state PDEs like allen Kahn equations, okay? Um, it's actually really similar. If you look at this final structure of pin, it's actually really similar to a pseudo spectral method, basically using the same uh, collocation idea, finite uh, series expansion, but the basis from pain is actually changed from data. So you get the basis from data, okay? And we also have a really good software package called TensorFlow DVQ, Tensor DVQ, where you can actually download from this link yeah, to play with uh, different PD solutions. Uh, we have uh, uh, examples building there already, and they can also try uh, uh, pin uh, on your own PD if you uh, problems, if you have particular PD in mind, okay? But uh, at the end, uh, using one single pin, you cannot provide uncertainty quantification. That means that you cannot actually quantify how bad you're actually solving uh, the uncertainty, you're actually solving the solutions at these uh, collocation points. So we want to build that in. So that's why we propose a second method called the Gaussian process, uh, uh, physics informed Gaussian process method, okay? So uh, in this case, we're gonna assume that my basis are actually a Gaussian process, okay? So we're gonna consider a really, really simple uh, case to start out with because the uh, generalization is actually pretty long, okay? So we're gonna consider an open bounded domain, uh, maybe of uh, one or two dimension, but you can actually push it to higher dimension, okay? With some delicious boundary. And then a, a non identical PD satisfying, a solution satisfying this particular long identical PD uh, equation where negative Laplacian of this U star plus this tau, which provides the nonlinearity into this equation is equal to some forcing. And then on the boundary, we have the boundary condition, the duration of boundary conditions. We're gonna assume that the data F, G, and also tau are actually continuous or are good enough so that we have uh, the solutions in, exist in classical set. So we're gonna assume that otherwise, uh, uh, well, the development of weak solution for this particular problem is still, uh, is still ongoing, so we won't talk about that, okay? So we're gonna find the uh, PIGP solution, the approximation to the U star by minimizing this uh, optimal recovery approach by minimizing over certain space, okay? Such that it's actually the PD. So it is a constrained, PD constrained uh, minimization on this, on this uh, element, okay? And then, um, so this U here is actually really nice. It's called uh, a, a reproducing kernel Hilbert space, okay? Associated with some uh, pre determined, pre given uh, kernel function that is symmetric and positive definite, okay? And then we actually will choose case such that the solution space is within, 
it gives us at least twice continuous differential uh, derivatives and uh, more than and all the way continuous up to the boundary. Okay. Well, uh, we cannot solve the PD at, at many points as possible. So we will solve the PD at discrete points. So that brings uh, up the question about propagation point again. So we're gonna minimize PD at discrete points, okay? Uh, for M omega is within the computational boundary and then M omega plus one all the way to M is on the boundary, okay? Then the, the minimizer of this particular optimal recovery problem can be interpreted as a MAP estimate. Okay. However, if the, uh, the conditions, the constraints are not linear, then you do not have the condition GP is not GP anymore. So we, we cannot have the variance computed that easy. Okay. But we want to solve it. Now, how can I solve it? Uh, uh, for this particular nonlinear elliptical PDE, I'm going to assume because I have a Laplacian operator and also the identity. So I'm going to assume that my Z1 gives me the identity at this discrete point. Z2 gives me the negative Laplacian. Uh, you can change it to positive, it doesn't really matter, okay? Now, based on this, how can I actually use these two discrete points to express my final solutions, okay? So I'm gonna uh, define this uh, operator, this phi m here as the uh, uh, point-wise evaluation because I am dealing with an RKHS, so everything is continuous, so I can actually do that, okay? And then uh, phi two gives me the point-wise evaluation after I take the negative Laplacian, okay? And then I will put everything together into this one big vector Z and then all the operators into this one big vector phi, okay? And then I'm gonna define this capital theta X phi here as a M plus M omega dimension vectors where each entry is just evaluating this integral. And because phi M, either phi M1 or phi M2, they are just point wide Point-wise evaluation, this integral is basically just evaluating this kernel at the point, either uh, the identity or taking the negative repulsion. So it's not actually the integral. I don't need to take the integral. That makes everything easier. Okay. And then I'll define that theta uh, of phi phi is actually the m plus omega square matrix, where I do a point-wise evaluation both of phi m and phi m. Okay. So if they're the same. Uh, of the same type of both phi one, I will just evaluate the kernel at phi uh, xm and xn, uh, x, x and x prime. If they are not different, uh, they are, if they are different, then one of them will take the negative Laplace. So, or uh, both of them, or uh, both of them will do that. And then I can express these solutions at this vector here, the phi x phi uh, the theta x phi vector times this inverse of this big matrix. Okay, so that's the actually the only trouble that will give us because we need to invert a really uh, dense matrix times this uh, coefficients of the Zs, which are the Z1s and Z2s. So Z1s are the identity evaluation, Z2 are the negative Laplace, okay? And then because of that, my uh, norm, my norm of U uh, using this kernel, this RKHX norm of U can be easily expressed as this matrix vector uh, multiplication. So ZT, Z transpose times this big uh, theta matrix inverse of the theta matrix times z, okay? Then I can, well, I, let me also define the right-hand side. So basically I just want to put them all into a vector form, okay? So I can replace the minimum uh, element uh, uh, <coughs> thing with this matrix vector uh, multiplication that is constrained into this right-hand side that has all of my PDE information, okay? So f of z has all the PDE information inside the computation domain is a PD, out on the boundary is just the duration condition. So we have that, okay? We either solve this constraint minimization or we solve the unconstrained minimization by, bring, by bringing in the uh, in equality into this as a, uh, a regularity condition. So we can actually try to solve this one, okay? So two different equations, okay? And most of the time we'll solve the regularized version instead of the unregularized, uh, the constrained version. Okay, so now let's uh, do a normal test on this. So we'll take that uh, a, a two-dimensional uh, uh, domain uh, from zero to one, okay? And then we can take tau in either being zero, which gives us back the linear PDEs, and then or, or tau view is U cubed, which gives me the non-linear uh, uh, elliptical PDE, okay? And then we'll take the, uh, the boundary condition to be zero, so it's to a homogeneous boundary conditions. Uh, and most of the time we're gonna assume I have a two uh, solutions and then plug in to obtain the forcing right-hand side, okay? 
Uh, another thing is I want to mention is about kernel. So for this particular method, uh, one has to be really careful about how to choose a proper kernel. Uh, in this case, for these solutions, we'll use a Gaussian kernel. Uh, you can also use a Green's function as your kernel or some other uh, different kernels like, like the sine kernel. If you see periodicity in your solutions, you can use the sine kernel or other kernels. But uh, for most cases that we try, we use only Gaussian kernel, okay? We use this uh, Gaussian kernel with the uniform length scale two sigma here, uh, sigma here, but you can actually use different sigma for different components of X. Okay, remember X is in RD dimension. So in this case, in R2, you can actually use two different sigmas here, okay? Once we use the Gaussian kernel, this theta matrix here, the theta of phi phi matrix here, so let me mention here, here can actually become really ill-conditioned. So we actually need to uh, add a regularization term to it to make it actually invertible. Remember, we actually need to invert the phi matrix, okay, a uh, theta matrix in order to solve for the ultimate uh, uh, recovery problem, okay? So basically we just nudge it a little bit. So R is actually a blockwise, a block diagonal matrix, okay? And then once we do that, we can do a Chelowski decomposition on this theta and then uh, it becomes R after you stabilize it after, then we can actually decom uh, do, um, find the inverse end by doing this Chelowski decomposition, okay? We will test it with only a thousand points. So in this case, I am using half of that. A thousand point in the uh, domain, only 900 them inside the computational domain. And then I'm gonna take the length scale for my Gaussian kernel to be m to negative uh, quarter, okay? And because uh, I'm using the regularized version, uh, I'm not using the constrained version, so I need the eta to be, well, I mean the beta to be 10 to negative five. And for this negative term, I also taking eta to be 10 to negative five, okay? We also going to compare the solution side by side, but also with the errors. So let me show you how to do uh, the example of doing this nonlinear electrical P, uh, PDE, okay? So uh, it uses three uh, uh, package that we actually build up. Uh, uh, I'm sorry that uh, we cannot show you the package right now, but uh, I actually can come up with a really simple implementation of this. So if you are interested, I can actually send you the code. Okay, so uh, so for this uh, nonlinear uh, non identical PDE, so we define the true solutions. As usual, we define the right-hand side according to the true solutions. Okay, uh, did I define the tau? So I did not define the tau. So we're gonna do a zero one uh, square domain, okay? And then here is my two solutions. That's, we just plot out the two solutions. Now we're gonna set up the uh, Gaussian process for solving this. So I'm gonna define the domain, computational domain to be two, dimension of the computation to be two, the dimension of the output domain to be one, okay? Uh, final time is at one, um, I mean, zero, one, zero, one in both X and Y directions. And then we will take 900 points in the computational domain, 100 points on four, different boundaries. So a total of, uh, of 124 points. So if you divide them by four, you get only uh, 32 points on each uh, boundaries, okay? So the final, the final number of points is, is the data points plus the uh, collocation point and boundary points. We got a negative quarter for the sigma term, okay? So uh, the PIGB builder will build all of this information and also the kernel functions, I believe. Right? and also uh, uh, generalize all these collocation point and boundary condition points, okay? So this is my Y vector that contains the, uh, the forcing term and the boundary values. Uh, and then, um, yeah. So here Q and QB uh, represent the number of uh, operators, linear operators that are defined totally by the problem for our uh, nonlinear elliptical problem. I have one is U, the other one is just negative Laplacian. Oh, this should be negative Laplacian, okay. So I have two operators total, uh, including the one that defined on the boundary, okay. Uh, uh, once I have that, I'm gonna call the first one is the identity, the second one is negative Laplacian, okay. Uh, uh, and then we'll build the kernels, okay. So the first kernel is just a normal Gaussian kernel. The second one, you actually need to, uh, yeah, uh, find out the Laplacian of this kernel with respect to the second variable. Remember, we are doing the, the, the big theta ma uh, matrix. 
And then the next kernel is you do a double Laplacian on both the X variable and Y variable, okay? So that you, after you define all of this, now you can construct the KX vectors, which is the theta X vector there, okay? And then you need to define the PDEs. So the PDE is just negative Laplacian plus tau of your identity uh, operator applied, uh, negative Laplacian of U plus tau of U. Okay, so basically that, and you need to differentiate with respect to each z variable. So that's why how I get these, and then you have the boundaries. You you also need to differentiate that with respect to to the uh, the z variables. So I get ones, and the eta is just the uh, negative term. You don't need to go to that negative ten, but that's the that's the weight. Here is the output of the points I used to set up this. This problem, so the blue represent the boundary condition points, and the orange one are the computational PD residual points. Okay, so we will take the forcing at these PD residual points. As you can see, to compute the solution using PIGP is actually really, really fast. Uh, in this case, I only chain for six iterate, and I use less than a second to actually find the solutions. Okay, so if I compare them, so the L2 error is actually 10 to negative four and infinity is 10 to negative four. And the point-wise error, I also can get to 10 to negative four. So it's really small. And I also can capture this periodic, periodicity in both X and Y directions really well, okay? So this is my, uh, I shouldn't show you this because it, should, it only works for, for linear case, okay? So I have that, okay? So this is for the uh, nonlinear elliptical PDs using PIGPs, okay? Uh, we can oh we can skip this heat equations okay you can also we, it can also handle icono uh, PD so let me show you the icono PD case so let me show the icono PD so the icono PD is uh, is basically using image processing basically you have the uh, uh, the gradient square is equal to some forcing plus a little bit diffusions uh, towards the each boundary so you have this the concentration of the energy in the middle and then slowly diffuse away into the boundaries in really square and symmetric way, okay? And then if you go through all this, uh, the, the, the different definitions, so in this case, so this is my icon of PD, okay? So it's a, the square of the norm of the gradient is equal to the square of some forcing plus epsilon plus the Laplacian. So I actually have four different operators. The first one is the identity operator, which it doesn't appear in the PD, but it appears in the boundary conditions. So you need to uh, calculate, add that into your total uh, consideration, okay? And then the, the second one is the X derivative, the third one is the Y derivative, and the last one is just the Laplace, okay? So we have a total of four different operators, okay? Basically, that's how you set up all the kernels. Once you set it up, that's the, uh, the same setup for the points, okay? You can see it's really discontinuous is here is one and everything is zero. And then I use about 40 seconds to actually solve for the PDE. And uh, I, I can obtain actually about 10 to negative four accuracy for the L2 errors, relative L2 errors. And then if you compare the two solutions, uh, the, the PIGP solution is actually really close to the uh, two solutions, okay? So that's the icono. We can actually solve for the nonlinear PDEs, okay? You can also do with the uh, burgers, but we will not do that, okay? So what I want to conclude is that for the uh, Gaussian process is that uh, somehow the Gaussian process can handle nonlinear elliptical type of PDE better than uh, PIN. Actually, it can use a, a rather really smaller set, set of collocation points to find uh, solutions within a really high accuracy, okay? Uh, PIN is actually easier to, uh, for it to handle parabolic PDEs, okay, as you can see. Okay, well, uh, I'm not saying that PIGB cannot handle parabolic PDEs, it's just for parabolic PDEs, you need to actually find the proper kernel uh, and the link scale to actually handle that, okay? And if uh, you have a linear PDE, it can also provide you an uncertainty quantification. Uh, as you can see at the end, I can output the variance at each computational point to tell you if I'm uh, really confident, if this method is really confident about the accuracy of that solution, okay? And uh, it can handle really high dimensional domain because everything is just assuming this X is some vector. It, uh, it, it has, the number of equations have nothing to do with the dimension of the domain, okay? It's basically the number of points you want to get, okay? And because the way that we express the, the final solution, so the U 
here is this, okay? So you can evaluate the final solutions at any point inside the computational domain. So it provides kind of the auto interpolation, right? It doesn't, it doesn't need to be uh, finding the solutions. You don't, you don't need to interpolate the solution between all these uh, grid points. You can just evaluate right away, okay? And it can also do auto differentiation somewhat. You just need to differentiate the kernel in order to do that, okay? And the, uh, however, the accuracy of your solution depends heavily on your choice of a proper, proper kernel. So uh, for example, if I, so let me do the nonlinear elliptical uh, uh, PD. If I increase uh, uh, my sigma uh, a little bit more, so maybe five, and then we, so for example, so we can remember this. So the accuracy is about one times 10 to the negative four. So let me, because this is really fast. So let me just run it right away. So you can see here, if I made this, even a teeny mistake of choosing uh, uh, this link scale here is just m to the uh, negative five instead of 2.5, the solution that I get at the end is just garbage. So that's what I want to say is that you have to be really careful of choosing the, the link, uh, link scale sigma thing, okay? Especially if you're using Gaussian curve. Okay, we're actually developing a method to, to actually choose this uh, sigma for you uh, from the data. But for right now, you have to be really careful, okay? And, and uh, the whole methodology only works with uh, Dirichlet, Neumann, and Robin uh, type of boundary condition. Uh, the periodic boundary condition needs a little trick of this expression, just need to trick it a little bit. But uh, I'm actually working on that, okay? and. Uh, in order for it to handle system of PDEs, PIN is actually rather easier to handle system of PDEs. Basically, you just declare your output to be uh, multidimensional. But for this one to handle system of PDE, uh, you actually have to be careful about uh, how to write up everything as a vectors and the norm has to be uh, vectors. So it actually needs a lot of attention to, to actually extend that to system of PDEs, okay? So that's, that's, the, uh, that's the PIGP method. We actually go on through, so we actually gone through two different types of methods uh, as solving hit equation viscous burgers. And also uh, I also want to show you the RTE at the end, okay? Using either PIN and also PIGP, okay? Uh, and then we also discuss, discussed that, that PIN is actually a little bit better at solving periodic PDE, uh, not all the case. Uh, and then PIGP is actually better than PIN at solving nonlinear elliptical PD. Okay. And both methods have this at their own weakness and string. Uh, PIN, you need to give it a lot of collocation point for it to actually converge. And you actually need to give it a lot of uh, extra uh, uh, physical conditions, uh, equations if you are dealing with hyperbolic PDs. Uh, for PIGP, you don't need to have that many, uh, to give it that many number of collocation points. Both of them are meshless, can do auto interpolation. Uh, PIN is easier to differentiate. PIGP is a little bit difficult to differentiate, but still can provide you kind of auto differentiation, give you the derivative. Uh, the, the main point here is, uh, can we actually combine the two uh, into some kind of hybrid method? Uh, for example, a deep kernel uh, uh, Gaussian process uh, that can actually help you to solve PDE in various different ways. So yeah, um, so uh, I still have some time. So let me go through the uh, radioactive transfer equation with you briefly using PIN. Uh, and then we will go back to the question uh, uh, at the end. So let me show you this example, okay? So this is, this is from the Michel's paper uh, as solving the radioactive transfer PDEs. Uh, uh, on, this is only 2D but you can actually uh, extend this idea to a, a more seven dimensions. So we can actually do it really, really efficiently with this, with this particular PDEs, okay? So remember, we are gonna express this uh, integral as a, 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 a Riemann sum, uh, particularly better if you use a Gaussian uh, uh, quadrature to actually, uh, to, actually uh, to approximate this uh, integral. So we actually use a Gaussian quadrature to actually approximate 
Okay, uh, same thing here. So we, all, we already gone through the details. So what I wanted to show you is at the end is I only have uh, maybe it's only a quarter of the whole total boundaries, okay? Uh, because for radioactive transfer equation, you can only specify inflow boundary conditions. So it's only this uh, uh, one eighth of these uh, boundary conditions. But at the end, uh, actually it took me uh, two hours to do, uh, more than two hours to do. At the end, I actually can uh, obtain a, a accuracy down to 10 to negative four with only a quarter of my total boundaries. Okay, so I can actually do that, okay, with ping, uh, but you need to train for like two hours in order to get that, okay. So yeah, that's it. Uh, I already showed you some, uh, a lot of examples. So uh, I think we have about 10 minutes left. Uh, any particular questions you guys want to ask or, or want me to go through uh, before we uh, end this webinar? Or do we have a question and Q&A time for this webinar series or no? All right, uh, if you don't have any questions at all, I want to show you another example is using uh, PIGP for uh, the Hamel's equation. So uh, uh, the reason why I conclude that PIGP is better than uh, better at solving elliptical type of equations. Uh, uh, oh, okay, I see a, a question. Sorry, sorry. Yes, let me let me. Oh uh, yes, uh, I can share my slides. Yes, yes, yes. Can you can you send me email? Send send me an email via. Thank you. Uh, um, I want to mention that uh, uh, that uh, the, you, if you use PHGV to solve Hamel's equation, which uh, uh, is shown that Ping has trouble to solve this uh, really simple linear elliptical PDE, you can you can solve it really high accuracy with PRGP. See here, I only use ten seconds and only about a thousand point down to ten to negative five uh, using PRGP, which drives me to. Uh, that's why I gave the conclusion that uh, Gaussian process is, is better at solving uh, 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 elliptical PDEs. Uh, I actually, yes, I have, I have a Darcy's example here, but this is the inverse Darcy example. So uh, the Darcy example is that the, uh, the coefficients is actually heterogeneous uh, media. Uh, it can actually handle that pretty well with the Gaussian process, but I have not tried it for uh, uh, for 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 uh, ping yet. So uh, I'm actually this is this is to answer the question about uh, how to handle heterogeneous media. Uh, I would say that it might be uh, easier for Gaussian process to do that. I'm not sure about ping yet, but uh, ping uh, if you give it enough time and enough collocation point and, uh, and training time, it should be able to capture that, okay? Uh, yes. Copy this. Uh, any other questions? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I want to also show you the viscous, viscous burgers example using GP. As you can see, it can solve uh, the parabolic uh, uh, equation okay, but this time I'm using viscosity at about, uh, where's my viscosity? Uh, oh. Uh, Yeah, about 0.02. So uh, uh, ping can handle 0.01 over pi, which is less than 0.03, uh, around that scale. But uh, if you use uh, the same method to, to, for PIGP, it can only handle about 0.01, maybe at, at 0.075. OK, 
Okay, anything less than that kind of viscosity level, the solutions will not be good. So you can see here, uh, it's actually more smooth out uh, 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 given by the PIGP method than PIN. PIN actually can capture the shock behavior, uh, the shock transition behavior a little bit better than, than, than PIGP. Uh, it's probably because the, the link scale that I gave it to the solutions is here that I'm only using uh, what I'm using here a little bit. So here I'm using a heterogeneous uh, uh, link scale for the Gaussian kernel. So, but then we've been playing with these, these parameters uh, for quite a long time. This is like one of the best selections that we have. So yeah, um, well, if there are no more questions, uh, I want to wait a little bit more, maybe for four more minutes. Okay, so that's the PIGP. Um, Yeah, the, the Misha example, this particular Misha example is actually really easy. So uh, uh, I improve upon it. So I spent about uh, two hours, uh, a little bit more than two hours to get down to 10 to negative four. You can actually only do one hour, you can get about 10 to negative two. So the Misha example is actually rather easy. We're actually working on a, a, a so the Misha example is for the pain, uh, plane parallel uh, radioactive transfer equation. Uh, Oh, uh, most of the time for, so for the questions uh, about the hyperparameters for the Gaussian process, most of the time we pick as the, the link scale is just uh, the total number of points to negative a quarter. We pick that. Uh, it's, it turns out that's the, that's the best uh, uh, link scale to use. If you have parabolic uh, PDEs, then you have to be careful. Say for example, for the Burgers equation, the, the sigmas we hear is, is, is one over three times square root of two for the time and one over 20 times square root of two for, this, for the space. And uh, we actually spend quite a lot of time at choosing that. Yeah, so uh, we do not have an automatic way to do it right now. We're still developing a, a, a so-called kernel flow method that is actually from Sync Caltech group uh, on my slide. Uh, so we're trying to adapt that for PDEs, yeah. Oh, uh, no, um, so, uh, so, generally, so generally speaking, uh, generally speaking, uh, I, I always do Adam plus LBFGS. Uh, I do not try the second order method right away, but some paper suggests using the second order right away, but I always do the first order method first. And the learning way is five to the uh, five times 10 to the negative four. You can actually increase it. We actually have a learning scheduler building in our code. Uh, uh, it's just that uh, starting out from tech to 94 is, is, a, is a better heuristic guess, okay? Uh, uh, I would suggest you to choose uh, around 10 to negative three to 10 to negative four as the starting point with a learning rate scheduler. So, so and, and and most of the time, Adam plus LBFGS is better. It is indeed better, especially for the sort problem that we are trying. Uh, if we do not do the second order method, the Adam, no matter how hard we try, it's just uh, not giving up anything. So we have to do Adam plus a second order method, okay? Yeah. Uh, uh, for, sim for simpler problem, we 
we choose something around 10 to negative three or 10 to negative four. For harder problem, we will do 10 to negative five, but then they do try uh, increase the maximum number of iterations uh, to as, as large as possible. That's what we are doing with this. Thank you. Uh, it will be posted online on our uh, Tamit's YouTube channel. So once it's posted, uh, I will send out a link to everybody who's interested. Uh, and also, again, uh, if you are interested at uh, uh, my, my sample code uh, for these, uh, I shall be able to give you most of them, uh, except for the Gaussian process. But I, I can give you a really simple Gaussian process sample code uh, if you're interested. So. For for the for the for the sample for the demonstration, I used it used a building package that we developed, so uh, it's still under development, so we don't want to show it. But we, I can show you a really simple template if you are interested. Okay. I think yeah, that's it. Uh, thank you so much for participating. Thank you uh, for for the good questions, interesting questions, and uh, I guess I will uh, see you guys two weeks later for my second webinar. Or maybe four weeks later. Okay. Thank you. Me. Thank you. Uh, should I stop or should I let me stop share? Yeah, just stop. Should be fine. The so recording will automatically stop anyway. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. 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 Bye. Bye. Bye.